guys very quickly, I'd do like to give you a very close and personal experience, which all consists of the birds coming incredibly low over the top of your head. Uh, so we always say at any point a bird looks like it's going to hit you, do me a favour and duck. Um, if you can pull a dramatic face that happens, it just makes it really exciting for us at the front. Uh, in terms of food, and eagle food tucked away, if you get food out in the middle of the show, uh, birds investigate, they steal it off you, and then I've got to do vets runs all through the night because you've made my bird ill, so please do make sure food is all tucked away. Drinks are fine, they're not a problem. Uh, the only thing I say with drinks is please don't put them on the floor. I've got one bird that thinks it's hilarious to grab coffee cups and he'll just run off with it. Um, he runs about 40 mile an hour and I don't, so I won't get you drink back. So just make sure you keep all of them, put them on benches, stuff like that. Um, I do need everybody staying seated throughout the whole show. I can't have anybody moving around or standing up um, just because with how low the birds are going to be flying, the last thing I want or need today is a collision. <laughs> Most important thing, I've worked with animals my whole life. I've grown up with all the birds in the centre. And the one thing you learn through working with animals is that they read body language better than anything. So as you're walking around the park, yes, you come to see the birds, but you'll find that they're watching you in more detail than you're watching them. And just by how you're sat watching this show now, they'll learn everything about you by the way you sat, okay? Because that's how animals communicate out in the wild. So I always say, if you sit there with a smiley face, you'll get cracking sharp birds. Sit there with a miserable face, and they just look at you like, what is the point, okay? <laughs> Smile, enjoy it, you're on a day out. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And we're first gonna introduce you to a bird who goes by the name of Corey. And Corey is a Perrin Lana falcon, so he's a hybrid falcon. Uh, cross between the peregrine, fastest animal on the planet, can hit speeds in a vertical stoop of about 230 miles an hour. And then you've got the Lana falcon, uh, which is an African and Asian falcon. Very, very stylish flying falcon. The reason why they're the most stylish falcon is because they've got a very elegant long tail. Uh, now, Corey's actually my falcon. I've had him now for nine years. Um, I always flew Sakers from being very little and then quite fancy I'm going to go with a peregrine and then when I went to pick him up he said I've not got a peregrine I've got a perilana and I looked at him and I just thought I can't leave without you so I took Corey home uh, and I've got to say he's one of the coolest birds in the world. Peregrines and falcons in general by far are one of the most determinated animals you will ever meet. Uh, they're one of the most competitive animals you'll ever meet. So in terms of flying the falcon I'm going to be flying the falcon very differently to how we would do any other bird. Uh, and that's because this bird is something that we'd call an airborne predator. So what this bird will do is it will catch its prey out the air. It will literally stoop out of nowhere and smack its prey out the air. And it will do that because it comes in obviously over 100 mile an hour. Now if I flew Corey to my glove, the impact that he's going to hit my glove at is gonna really hurt. The impact he's gonna come in at is gonna really hurt the falcon. So what I'm currently doing is flying him to something called a swingler. It's a leather pack and it's got his dinner time to it. And what he's got to do is stoop at it and try and achieve his dinner. Now some of you might look and think, oh, are you teasing the falcon? You're making it chase for its dinner. If you think this falcon is being teased, you don't know falcons. Falcons do not do tease, they do compete. Because if you don't have this determination out in the wild, you don't succeed. A falcon has to go, go, go again, keep going until it achieves its dinner. So you'll see now Corey's come in at quite fast stoops and he's coming in at all different angles. He wants to make sure that I never learn the routine that he's getting himself into. You can see he's trying these vertical stoops a bit more and that's because he comes in so much quicker when he tries that. You can see he's leaving each time between each stoop and that's because he knows that the more I swing this lure, the more my arm is going to start getting really tired. This falcon could do this for four or five hours quite easily. I fly with falcons every day, but I am no way as fit as a falcon. They are an athlete and that's the most incredible thing about them. Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one more pass. And then I'm going to shout, help, which means I'm done. Corey knows that means he can come in. Can that little falcon have a round of applause? Because I thought he'd been a lovely little falcon. So for ones with keen eyesight, we'll see now he's slapped. He whips it into the ground as hard as he can. And then he grabs it at another point and whips it again. So what you'll find is that he'll always pick different points on the snake. He'll never ever 
There's a, a meet and greet session going on at the minute where we're being introduced to uh, a variety of birds of prey. As you can see, there's a tawny owl there. Three, Sky. Because like wolves, these birds actually live and hunt in packs. 
Which is great, will you? Because most beds, never, never even come. Not good ladder beds because this bed's got quite a wee away from the spray. So these beds tend Ooh. to be found in two types of environments, and we're talking open plains or dense forests. Now, if you're out in the open plains, there could be no trees, you know, 10, 20, even 30 miles away. You know, think about America, how big it was, there's a plant North America. There could be no pitches for a long, long way. So what these beds do, they make the most out of a pitch while you can get it. So what will happen is, one of these will sit in there like me, let's say, a cat's maybe in a dead tree, something like that. And then one bed will jump on his back, one will jump on his back, one will jump on his back, and so on and so forth. And they actually stack about seven, eight beds tall. Because again, these beds are from Pan and Bacon, so what that means is, the dominant female at the very, very top, she's got the best advantage point. So you can imagine if there's a mother, like, say, four or five beds in Todd's back, they'd be up here, so they'd be quite high. And again, the dominant female at the very, very top, she's got the best viewpoints from around miles and miles and miles around where they are. Now, these halls have got eyesight eight to ten times better than we have. So when you're up with eyesight, they've got that on the hall. They can see details from the leaves, again, miles away in the distance, so the only thing that's up the top, she sees some prey, she takes off for it, that will collapse beneath and it'll all go and chase their prey. In fact, they're not so from fact for you, so here. Uh, these birds, their prey, about 60% of household prey will die from pure stress before it gets caught. Because the thing is, if you're getting chased by, you know, six, seven of these, you don't know about it, and that'll be a little bit freaky for them. So, again, most prey they're hunting, they'll just be panicking that much if they're in this bag before they get caught. Two years from here, that's probably a better way to go because how these birds hunt by a house for a very cheap actually compared to what the bird is. Very, very cheap. It could be in your back garden the same day. So people see what we do and think, well, I can yourself because all you do is start your bird and put it back to you. I'll have to look. So what I mean, please, put a bit of a wheel up and bear to me hand here. Oh, no! Oh, you are! Now, this is Oscar. He's one of our four captains to be out here in the morning. Now, the devil of the cutest person that we have here in the panel, just look how I love the little face. Just all the times I've got days when I'm all going to do, all going to do a ring around for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you, Mike. Now, Oscar, like I said before, the cat. Now, the thing is, uh, humans have been working for a pole cat for thousands of years. In fact, if you saw Hudson back in the day, it was back in the day, no fun, no sugar, no butcher, no that. That's all for your own food. And I wish that would be with a pole cat. The whole reason that a pole cat was, you get a rabbit kind of bottom, you put a pole cat down the rabbit hole, yeah. keep chasing out the rabbits, and then you're going to get crashed by maybe like a bit of prey, maybe like a dog, you can catch it in the net yourself. That's how you get your dinner. So you're going to have it over your back and have your teeth that night. Oh, well, that's you. But the problem was, yeah, he likes to look at the leg. Give him 10 to be biting me hands off. <laughs> yeah, so that's how you hunt the prey back in the day. But the thing is, the pole cat was a little bit too fast. So when he kind of catches a bit fast and slower, and that way you can chase the rabbit out and you've got your dinner job and good. So that means feathered back in the day, again, okay, we're one of man's best friends, we're kind of hunting their food. Nowadays, not really needing because, again, you've got like, you know, butchers, supermarkets, that kind of thing, you buy food nowadays. But some parts of the country, some parts of the world, people still rely on feathering to kind of catch their dinner. Now, Oscar is very, very flexible and bendy. In fact, what I'm going to show you how flexible he is. I can literally get Oscar like this, and I can literally fall in half. Uh, I can literally get him like a form and half, he just doesn't care, as you can see, he's wet laying past, he just doesn't care. I can get him kind of side to side, to and fro, round around, just doesn't care. Because the thing is, he's designed for that, he's designed to go down and kind of rabbit holes and bush. You see how flesh my spine is, he just doesn't care what's up. He's like a little stinky, basically. And that's how he kind of he works, but that's what makes him such a little successful hunter. I get him down rabbit holes, through the kind of twists and turns of the rabbit burrows and the worms, and you can chase him out no problem. Now, Oscar here, now ferrets, or they're part of the family that we call the mustelids. It's which is actually the weasel family. In my opinion, the weasel family are the toughest animals in the entire kingdom world because the thing is, they look quite small and cute, but they pack a massive punch. So Oscar's cousins went with the male weasel. Weasels are the real smallest true carnivore, about six inches long. They're hunting down rabbit chairs, you know, 50, 100 times their size. They're so tough and so strong. They're money badgers, I'm an African age bear, kind of like with the cousins. They're actually chasing lions off their prey. That's how tough these little fish on these are. The sheer lions within them go, you know what, that's why I know they're going to go. And he actually will tantalize and talk lions that much and fight lions off. The lions say, you know what, you can have it, it's not worth the hassle. So the lions actually get bullied off their prey by bunny bags, but they get all the monsters' cousins. And also one of the bigger cousins is the wolverine. So if you hear the word wolverine, you think, oh no, X-Men, you know, Marvel, all that. He actually is based on reality, which is a wolverine, and I guess one of the monsters are the bigger cousins. But if they say, wolverine's so tough, 
So the thing is, my nuts as I walk around, I get a little wax and weird smell. Oscar does stink, I'll be honest with you. That's your pongs. But the thing is, you're not dirty or disgusting, that's just how bad it smells. That's just kind of natural muscle to them because the thing is, they have lots of different oils in their coats, that protects them, which makes them a little bit stinky. Now, if Oscar ever feels threatened, what he does is, he lets off a massive stink bomb. So if you get attacked by a bigger predator, maybe a little feather, for example, kind of maybe competing some food. He lets off a massive stink bomb and it does stink bomb, so it's not to be solved. Now here, uh, at the moment he's quite content and happy, you can see he's just not bothered, so he's quite, you know, quite laid back, so he's not going to let off a stink bomb anytime soon. But, um, but yeah, but when you feel threatened, he's going to off a really powerful foul kind of smell. Now, nowadays, these are quite a common household pets. In fact, I've got some myself as a pet at home, which is, again, I kind of wear for that, kind of prefer to be used myself. And again, you can look at more different colours, and the same size, different kind of pork cat colours, different kind of blacks, whites, and albino, sluggy kind of bed, and you have micro pets, and you have fluffy ones. So, now these are more kind of common household pets. Now, she does a little bit of run around for us, and I look around the street and the sofa, because she's just got to play. Oh. Yeah, but I know she's going to chase me. The worst thing you've just seen, they're just so lovely and what I've got about it. I don't mind them too. We might go from Danny's dad's bouncing away. But you're not scared. They're on the grass. He's just so lovely and so playful. Now, and the thing, like I said before, so these aren't true carnivores, so they're eating pure meat. They're not eating like veggies or not like that, like any kind of grass or stuff like that. They're just pure carnivores. Look at that, you just see. He's just so playful. When you want to bite, you can't bite right so far. That's how you feel, it's pretty really rough, wouldn't you, Oscar? Yeah. Baby, let's go to this pack of dress, let's see if that's all around. Do you know what I'm going to Oscar? Yeah. Go into this, I'm so curious. If they've got their mind, there's something they just want to keep going back to and back to. Yeah, but <laughs> he's just a few little bit of a layer of our ears. But that does wrap up our uh, meeting with these folks. Have you all learned something new? Have you any questions to ask yourself? <laughs> I'll stand here for the next couple of moments with Oscar. My hands will come to Oscar close, that's fine again. Um, our next thing will be at 3 o'clock, our big show, Take a Flight. The event's looking quite good at the moment, it's going to be outdoors. Um, <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. So uh, it should be outdoors, so that would be so it starts off kind of one bit at a time. At the end about 25 bits at the same time flying around. So we'll be having that, be sure to get a good seat for folks. Uh, if you're interested in after the show, come back some of the time to see the big show again. But uh, other than that, I'll leave you in Russell for a little bit. So yeah, I hope you've had a fantastic time so far. And uh, I'll see you next time guys. Thanks for the fun sitting there for us. to go again because you've used it all flying around 
So they use their energy to hunt their dinner and that's it. He actually doesn't see the point in flying because... Conservation only works if you love something. If you don't protect it, you don't love it. First of all, they provide vital ecological services. They clean up. There are natural garbage collectors. They clean up harvests right to the bone. They help to kill all the bacteria. They help absorb anthrax that would otherwise spread and cause huge livestock losses and diseases in other animals. Over 70 percent of them are mainly may become extinct in the future. So we focus a lot on trying to spread awareness.